this year's Shoshana is just very different to every other year. I'm not sure how to put it this way, but when you come to Shul this year, heads up, it's Rosh Hashanah this week. And when you come to Shul, there's going to be like a gaping hole in your Rosh Hashanah experience. Because when you're in Shul on Shabbat, and it comes to blowing off Shafer, and then like, um, we don't blow Shafer on Rosh Hashanah this year. And it's, it's a letdown. Like, okay, and? We have these guests who come to us, uh, and they're not religious people. Every year they come to Rosh Hashanah, and every year the Rosh Hashanah is like, they want to come on the night, the first night. So every year I'm trying to, yeah, but you also got to come on day to hear the Shafer. And this year I was about to say it, and then I'm like, oh, actually, it's fine. Thank God for the second day of Rosh Hashanah, at least we get to blow once. The question really we need to explore and understand is why is it that we don't blow the shofar? What's going on with not blowing the shofar? Now the typical reason that's given in the Gemara is that it's called Gzeira de Rabbah. The decree of Rabba. So this is way back when. Rabba made a decree. Rabba is one of the Amoraim. It actually originated in the times of the Beit HaMikdash, the second Beit HaMikdash, the second temple. And they realized that there was an issue because people were carrying on Shabbat. And you're not allowed to carry. So they had this decree. Because it's possible that someone won't blo- know how to blow the shofar, and it'll be Shabbat, and on Yom Tov you're allowed to carry, but on Shabbat you can't carry, so he may be tempted to take the shofar and carry it out into the street. Now you got a problem. So they said, okay, you know what? No more shofar. Why? Because someone maybe may carry. So if you want to know why you're not playing shofar for the Shabbos, that's why. Why would there be a thought that you're allowed to? It's not muktzah. A shofar on, well, it's muktzah on Shabbos because you're not allowed to blow shofar. That's why it became muktzah. If not, it would have been permissible. In the Torah, it says that you blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah. It doesn't say you don't blow on Shabbos. You do. You always blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah. <coughs> but okay. Rabbi, which means the rabbis, came up with a decree that there's no blowing shofar on Rosh Hashanah. So, so came about before Came about... No, muktzah means, halacha of muktzah, is that if something cannot be used on Shabbos, then it's called muktzah. If you're allowed to use it on Shabbos, it's not muktzah. Right? Muktzah is a rabbinic decree too. So shofar so on Shabbos is muktzah. The reason it's muktzah is because you can't blow it on Shabbos. If you could blow it, it wouldn't be muktzah. Right? But that's a separate discussion. Point is that thank you to the rabbis, and thank you to someone who may go carry, that's why you and I have to miss out on a very important mitzvah. Any mitzvah is important. It's a mitzvah ase de raisa. The Torah says to blow shofar on Shabbos. It's very, very, very strange that the rabbis would, would, would block you, prevent you from doing this mitzvah, and not just prevent you, but it's, it's, it's a maybe, because maybe someone will carry there's also something else that happens as a result. That is that, so whatever it is that you're supposed to do with shofar, it's not just blowing the shofar. Clearly, the goal of blowing the shofar is also to experience the, the work of blowing the shofar. There's a work that comes with it. You're supposed to do something when you blow the shofar. Whatever it is you're meant to do, here's what happens when it comes to Shabbat this year. We come into shul and you're like, okay. In fact, many ladies don't go to shul for that reason. Because the whole point of going to shul is shay first. There's no shay from the shama, so okay. Go on the second day. Which is too bad. Because almost like we're missing out on doing something. Now that's very, very significant in Rosh Hashanah. I'll tell you why. When Hashem made the world, right? We are now actually in the week before Rosh Hashanah very significant week because how long did Hashem take to make the world right six days and then there was Shabbos Rosh Hashanah is the anniversary of creation but do you know which day Rosh Hashanah actually celebrates because there's six days of creation and the seventh day is Shabbat which day is Rosh Hashanah almost 
not Shabbat, but sixth day. Rosh Hashanah is the sixth day of creation. What's, what's on the sixth day that's so significant? On the sixth day, Adam and Chava were created. Mankind came into being on the sixth day. So, actually, if you go back in time, there's day one, which is actually day six of creation. That means that you have day minus one, minus two, minus three, minus four, minus five. And the first day of creation is actually called day minus five of creation. Can you imagine that? What's day minus five? The 25th of Elul. Right? So there's 25 Elul, which is day one of creation, 26, 27, 28, 29, and then there's no 30th. One Tishrei is the sixth day of creation. So it's kind of like the world exists in this limbo, doing nothing, for those first five days until you get to the sixth day of creation, which is day six, which is Rosh Hashanah. Right? Why do we celebrate Rosh Hashanah on the sixth day and not on the first day as you would expect? Like Hashem started creating the world and it wasn't yet time. Time begins five days later. So like he's got these... It's strange, no? There you go. The answer is that something transpired on day six which made the existence worthwhile. What happened on day six? Adam was created. Without man, there's no point to the world. The point is, there should be a human being at the center of the world, and God gives a human being power. What's the power that he gives him? When Hashem made the world, when made man, it says, he took a piece of dirt, right? Afar. So, there's a piece of dirt on the ground. I was learning with my seven-year-old. We're learning Bereshis now. We're learning how to lame. And so we're going through the whole parsha, And it's absolutely fascinating to learn with a seven-year-old who doesn't know the story, really. So he's like, you know, like sitting there open mouth for every little bit of the story. And like, it's, it's so inspiring. We were learning about the Akeda. So, you know, he said, one more Pasuk. That's it, I'm out. One more Pasuk. I said, okay, one more Pasuk. So the Pasuk is that... Avram um, and is taking Yitzchak to the Akedah, and he says, and Yitzchak says to him, and says, Abba, where's, um, he says, I see the, the wood, I see the, the fire, but where's the, 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 the goat? He says, okay, we're done. So he's like, no, 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 one, one more, one more. Wow. And I was like, what? Because he wants to know, and then, what's he gonna, what's gonna do? What's gonna happen? It's beautiful to learn like that. It's like so real. So we're learning about the um, creation. And Hashem takes a piece of dirt, carves out man into the dust. And then, and he's listening, unbelievable. And like, I was living it, absolutely living it, explaining to my son. And he's like, and then Hashem blew life into this piece of dust. And then it just started walking and talking and it became a human being. It is quite mind-blowing if you think about it. But then there's the next pasuk which says right away, which means, and man became a living being. And it seems redundant. So my son looks at me and he's like, he just says that. He's paying attention. Because it says, he took the dust, formed man into the dust, blew life into man. So if he blew life into man, surely it's obvious that man became alive. Why does it say, and then man became a living being? The reason is because Hashem blew life into man and then something even greater happened in man. What happened is not that he became a living being. He became a being that gives life. What is man? Man is a being that gives life to the rest of the world. And that's a bit of a responsibility on all of us. It means that Hashem made man at the epicenter of creation. Nothing and no one else in creation has free choice except man. And when you exercise that free choice, what you're doing is building Hashem's world. So there's a nothingness, there's a world which is just a world, then it comes into you and you have absolutely free choice. You're supposed to exercise your free choice to crown Hashem as king. So as soon as Adam was created, what did he do? His first words were, he looked at himself, looks around, 
he thinks this is incredible, he suddenly sees that he has a consciousness. And he recognizes the purpose of consciousness is to direct it at Hashem. And so his first words were, Hashem malach geut lavesh. Hashem is king. Put on a garment of authority. And that's why every Friday we say that, Hayom Yom Shishi Shabbat, we say Hashem malach geut lavesh, because Adam on Rishon, that's what he said. And ever since then, Hashem said, on the sixth day of creation, in order for you to make creation work, you are not just a living being, you are the being that gives all life. The world cannot exist unless you as man crown Hashem as king. If you crown him as king, the world exists. If you don't, the world does not exist. How do you crown Hashem as king? That's what the Shefer is. Shefer is coronation. You're crowning God as king. If we don't crown Hashem as king, then the world doesn't exist. You want to argue that point? There's never been a year in history when the Shafer hasn't been blown. By definition. If you don't blow, someone else blows. What that means is the world will always continue to exist. But how the world will exist is very dependent on your Shafer. Every year we carve out another year into time. Because Hashem makes one year, one unit at a time. And every time comes that, that moment, he's like, okay, now you create a brand new unit, you call it a year, up to you to make a brand new world. If you don't make it, no world. Right? That's what it means. Man became a being of life. You give life to the world. So how you blow shofar and whether you blow shofar and what you do about shofar, that's how the world comes into being. If you don't blow shofar, well, that's a problem. Guess what? One question. The first time round. Who blew the shofar on the first time? In other words, I get that after man was created, he crowned Hashem as king. I don't get what happened before that? Which came first, chicken or the egg? Because if you're telling me that in order to create man, in order for a world to be, you have to summon to crown Hashem as king. So who crowned him as king to create the world in the first place? Follow the question. The first time around in creation, there was no man that existed. So Hashem had to make his own decision to create man. And after he made the decision, going forward now, every year, starting right away at year one, well, what happened was there was a man to create, to, to crown Hashem as king. But the first time around, there was no one to crown Hashem as king. So what Hashem had to do was do this, the work himself. So Hashem was like, okay, I want a world. I want to have this. I want to have man. Okay, let's create man. Who made that decision to create man? Hashem made the decision to create man. And every time thereafter, you have to make the decision. But the first time around was a decision from Hashem himself. You with me? That's called... Hashem decided on his own to do the chesed. So Hashem said, first time around, I'll do the work. Every other time around, you guys have to do the work. That's what it means. Va'amartem ko lechai. We say this on Motzei Shabbat. Va'amartem ko lechai. Ko lechai means, ko is chafhei. Chafhei is the 25th of Elul. Chai is bring life to it. Nefesh chaya, man. Take the core and give it a chai. Your job is to give life to the existence of the world and to creation. That's what you're supposed to be doing. So creation is just exists. The world just exists. When man accepts Hashem as king, man brings life to an existence which is otherwise dead. That's what we're supposed to be doing every Rosh Hashanah. Every Rosh Hashanah, we blow the shofar, we crown Hashem as king. The first time around, how do we do it? We didn't. Hashem did it on His own. There's one little problem in this whole thing. And that is that we don't blow shofar on Rosh Hashanah, which is on Shabbos. So what are you thinking? Who's doing the work? How does the work get done? When you come to Shul on Rosh Hashanah this year, again, the first day, remember, from the Torah, you only keep one day, right? So when you come to shul on the first day, what do you do? You walk into shul and the, the work is nothing, just relax. What should I do? I don't know. 
whatever Shaifer is, and we need to understand what Shaifer is, to crown Hashem as king, you're not doing that. So who's crowning him as king for this year? Someone pointed out to me that every year in history that fell out, I don't know if this to be true or not, he was saying that every year in history that big things happened was Rosh Hashanah and Shabbos. Like the base of Mikdash being destroyed both times, and it wasn't necessarily good. Last time it happened was, do you remember which year was Rosh Hashanah Shabbos? Yeah. Tafshin Pei. It was, um, it was started off as 2019. Oh. And then it became 2020. Oh. <laughs> and there was a thing called COVID-19 that year. <laughs> so that was a big year. <laughs> So I was like, oh, so what are you saying? He said, I don't know. I said, I, I think COVID-19 was actually a very, very relaxing. Had a lot of benefits to it. Depends how you look at it. It was actually a very good year in many ways. Maybe we ruined it, but it was a, on its own a very good experience. What does it mean that you don't do the work this year? Every year you're supposed to do the work. You're supposed to crown Hashem as king. So you're coming into shul and there's all these beautiful, amazing things about crowning Hashem as king. And because some yukul may not, may carry, so now none of us is able to do the mitzvahs aset de So There's still a mitzvah this year to blow shofar. And we don't blow. So the avayda is to do nothing. What we want to see is that not, not, the work is not to do nothing. First time round was do nothing. Because Hashem said, I'll do the work, I'll create man, and now, from now on, man can crown me. That was the first time round. Every other time round, Hashem says, Hevra, I got some work for you. You know what the work is? To do nothing. And when you understand what doing nothing means, you'll see the hardest thing in life is to do nothing. It's really, 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 really hard. And when you master the art of doing nothing, you become so powerful. It's so unbelievably, like it's, it's life transforming to do nothing. And heaven help anyone who walks into shul this year and thinks that there's nothing to do in Rosh Hashanah because we're not blowing the shofar. What we want to learn is how to do that nothing. To sit there and actually engage in the doing of no thing. And what does that mean? So Shabbos is a special time. What about tefillah? Oh, well, we do the tefillah, sure, but we're missing no, the... No, for sure the tefillah. But we're missing the main... Well, it does, but obviously, obviously you need a shayfer also, because shayfer is very powerful, right? So what does it mean to keep Shabbos? I th- we must have spoken about this before, but I'll go through it again. I think when, when, when a teenager tells you that I want to keep Shabbos, instead of telling them to keep Shabbos, try to figure out how to keep Shabbos yourself. Because maybe what they're saying is that I'm not feeling Shabbos from you. Can you keep Shabbos? If you keep Shabbos, I'll keep Shabbos. How do we keep Shabbos? You know how you keep Shabbos? You keep Shabbos by doing, by relaxing. Shabbos is oneg Shabbat, right? Pleasure. Of course pleasure means to eat some some good food, right? You have some uh, some fish and some chicken and some, some, uh, you know, chicken soup. Ah! So you have the ta'anug, oneg Shabbat. That's very nice. That's all external. To actually feel oneg Shabbat means to get yourself into a zone of absolute pleasure. That's how you keep Shabbos. Absolute pleasure means when Hashem made the world. So when he finished the six days of creation, what did he say? It's fascinating, right? You know that in the Torah, to the best of my knowledge, it doesn't say ever, you better keep Shabbos. What it says is, I keep Shabbos. <clears throat> if you want to be like me, you can also do it. Why should you keep Shabbos? Because Hashem works for six days and then he stops. Right? So how do you keep Shabbat? What do you do to keep Shabbos? You feel that all your work is done. That's what the Mechilta says. Kol melachtecha asuya. Feel 
all your work is done. There's nothing more to do. Done. Have you ever had that experience of all your work is done? <laughs> you have nothing more to do. Everything is done. If you haven't done that, then you haven't kept Shabbos. Then the people who you are educating are looking at you and saying, I'm not feeling Shabbos on you. What do you want? You keep Shabbos? You mean I should sit at that boring meal with you? You're not interested. Why should I? And why shouldn't I watch television on Shabbos? And what's wrong? Just a screen. Keep Shabbos means to sit there and to exuber exuberate an energy of absolute pleasure. So how do you do it? How do you get to the point that all your work is absolutely done? Very simple. Hashem gave us a brain. And the brain has an incredible power. The power of the brain is, it could like imagine things. It does it all the time. When you dream for good and not good, you could dream anything. You could change whatever you want in your brain. You ever been to um, like these... Um, so called um, optical illusions. Yeah. I went to a museum of optical illusions. Some of the things are unbelievable. Like you literally think that something exists. You see a ball on the one side and you come to the other side and it's empty. And you're like, how'd you guys do that? And then you see because there's a mirror in the middle. Right? And they make you think you're tall and short. And you walk in somewhere and the whole body disappears. And they put someone else's body on you. And like everything does. It's, it's optical illusions is incredible. But of course, it's not real. But the brain has a power to change reality all the time. Most of what your brain is telling you now is not real. Your brain tells you that you need to do things and that your work is not done. Why do you think that's true? Your brain makes you think that you are in control. Sometimes you realize, like, oh, I'm not much not, I'm really not in control. And you start noticing that Hashem is actually in control. There are two, if you think about it, like two operating systems. One is called dry land and one is called the ocean. Those who live in the ocean have a distinct benefit over those who live in dry land. If you look at the ocean, what do you see? You ever gaze at the ocean? And what do you see? Waves. Waves? You see nothing, water. A lot of water. Just one long line of water. That's what you see. It's unbelievable. You ever gone snorkeling? Like, or gone down into a, uh, an underwater aquarium, a submarine? Suddenly you discover it actually boggles the mind. Like that, it just, it belies the truth of what's really happening. There's so much going on underneath it. It's teeming with life. And like, you're like, these colors, the colors of the corals, it's like, it, it's unbelievable. I always go there like, what is Hashem thinking? Like, who does he need these guys for? Like, like he's so, you know, like, I, I thought I'm the center of the universe, that there's like so much else going on. There's like a whole society going on, and a bunch of these little fish, and so many different types and styles and options, and unbelievable. Then you go right back out of the water, what do you see again? Water. Every being in the ocean knows one thing. He comes from the water and he lives in the water. If you get out of the water, it can't exist. Then you move to dry land. It's exactly the same thing on dry land, right? What does dry land work? How does it work? On dry land, everyone comes from the land. We do. And one day, they open up a piece of ground they put the person back in and it's harsh but it's really where we came from in the first place so it's just we do belong to the land and everything you see comes from the dry land so why is it that when you look at the earth you don't see earth you see beings you'll never see that sense of absolute like immersion the ocean is immersion. Dry land is separation. On the ocean, the beings of the ocean feel a part of something bigger. In the dry land, the difference is 
We know we don't have a choice, right? Oxygen, you breathe. If you don't breathe, you can't exist. And yet every being on dry land feels separate. On day one of creation, Hayom Yom Rishon Bashabbat, what do we say on day one? We say a special psalm, a, a Tehillim. Right? You wanted to learn about Tehillim? Here, I'll give you one explanation. This is one that we say on Rosh Hashanah night and on Yom Kippur. We say this at the end of davening always. Every one of the nights of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, the high holidays, we say, Le David Mizmo, David gave a psalm. And what did he say? La Hashem Ma'aretz Umlua, Teveil V'yoshveva. Hashem has everything on earth. Teveil is the whole planet and everything you see in it. And everything who dwells in it is all his. Kihu al yamim yesada ve'al neharot yechonenea. He actually founded it on oceans. Dry land is actually on the ocean. On day three, Hashem said, push away the dry land to allow continents to appear so that push away the water so that the continents can appear. Everything's really on the water. What that means is you only think you live on dry land. You don't live on dry land. You actually live in the ocean. It doesn't look that way. When you look at dry land, you see dry land people. You see beings. But know the truth. And Rosh Hashanah and Kippur, this is the message. Everything is actually dry land. It's actually ocean. You know what that means? <clears throat> we all live in our own consciousness. Our consciousness is like it's separation. It's very lonely to be a human being because you have a brain and the brain does way too much thinking and then there's a heart and the heart does way too much feeling. And all of it makes you feel separate all the time. Wouldn't it be amazing if you could just let go? Like, you know who does that? Babies do that. They still don't know about their own existence. You remember the day when you first discovered you exist? It's like a distinct moment. It happens around the age of eight, psychologically. And then there's like that moment, like, I think little kids, until they grow to about the age of eight, they don't realize they exist. They know they exist, right? But then like you're on the bus, and the bus driver's screaming, move to the back! And it takes a realization of the child that he's talking to me. Like, you mean that I'm a being that you're shouting at me, right? For good and for not good. And it's like this realization that I exist. Little children don't feel that. They don't get that they actually matter. That's what happens when you become a teenager. Suddenly you get your own like, consciousness and you realize, I've got to figure this out myself. And then what it means is, whatever mommy does, I'm going to do the opposite. <laughs> Just because I want to feel what it's like to be independent. Exactly. I want to feel myself. And it's very difficult for mommy to accept. But it's okay. It's just testing out. It's great when you feel a part of something bigger. And then human beings crave, crave a sense of belonging. Not to feel abandoned. We're like social beings. We like to be in, in, in circles. We like to be accepted by, by not too big because I don't feel any more part of it, but something like a family, a family unit, relationships. We like to be a part of something. We like to let something higher absorb us because we live on dry land and we yearn for the ocean. Really, it's all of the rivers and the oceans. Every human being has this driving force beneath them. It's the force of being absorbed into something being bigger, something higher. We're dying for it. There's a force, a little, a little being inside of us that gives us that. The feeling of, of a sea, of an ocean. You know what it's called? Ta'anug, pleasure. Pleasure is a great experience. Pleasure means... When do you take pleasure? When you learnt a masechta, you learnt a tractate in the Talmud and you finished it. There's something to be said about, I finished it. The sense of completion. You built a house and the house is done. You look at that, it's like, wow. What are you experiencing? Onig. A feeling of all coming together. It's a great, great experience that all came together. When you marry off a child, 
and that moment of the wedding sometimes it may not be true but you think it's true at least for that moment and it's like okay I got them to the point and you like sense this sense of completion it's not complete there's lots more to do afterwards but at least for the moment you think it's complete and it feels like okay done we love to have like right a sense of 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 just something bigger taking us over it's so good and it's a feeling of onik and Hashem says in your minds I want you to do that every single week because it's really impossible for a human being to live in a space of thinking that the next thing is going to get me there you know how lonely and abandoned that is where are you trying to get to and everyone's got their answer to that question I'm trying to get to the point of like retirement what do you think happens when you retire now you're like okay now I have this that's what the world tells you right it's like you work to a certain age you work 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 and now you retire and then when you retire you want to go back to work there are no points in the world there is not a point in the world where you get what you want and you got it what you have is points where you think that the next point will get you there guaranteed that when you get there you'll see you're not there there's never a point of getting there there is no there other than Mashiach coming there's nothing there's no point where you now got to the ultimate this is where it is so when you're building a house it's amazing to watch right people spend years and they get and then finally they built the house they look at they're so excited and they built the house and then they sit there and they walk inside ah, feeling great and then they get depressed what was the point and then they're like okay let's do something else let's move to Florida just to shake it up a little bit bored humans that we are we're never ever able to reach the point of satisfaction Almighty God tells us, he says, Hevra, you need to feel satisfaction every single week. It's critical. And you could just stop thinking that on your mind that, but I have to still achieve this, that, and the other. You don't. There is a Hashem who loves you and he's taking care of you. And it's all good. It's all fine. Everything is awesome. Whatever's happening in your life is unbelievable. There's a little clinch of how you get there. See, that's individual to each one of us. Ask yourself the question, what's going to make me happy? The house? Getting married? Getting my kids married? Getting them out of the house? Making money? Everyone's got something, right? Take that something that you have in your mind in a futuristic way and think what's gonna happen when you get it what does it feel like to have it so it's called right you close your eyes you sit there in a dreamy space and you're just dreaming of having it we like to dream we know how to dream so just dream of the best shalom by the best situation everything unbelievable and feel that oh, wow and I'm in that space there's one little problem with when we dream. We dream about it, and we're like, be beautiful, I wish I had that. And then we stop, because we wake up and we say, I wish I had that. And there's only one reason why you don't have that. It's because you said, I wish I had that. If instead of saying, I wish I had that, you would actually feel that you have it, then you would have it would draw it to you it would come to you when you say I wish I had it you push it away hard work right it's hard work feeling good feeling pleasure because reality smacks you in the face and we love to dwell on the negative it's just more exciting more interesting to be negative to think of the good things is not and you say come on it's great look at reality of life look at how terrible this is 
Hashem is sending you what you want. The reason He puts something into your head of what you want is because He's sending that to you. Not It's not to make you feel like hard and horrible and harsh. He's giving you a feeling of, I want this and this to happen. And so in your heart, you want this and this to happen. Normal people, I should say not normal, regular people, live in the space of yearning for that something to happen. And it never happens their whole life. And the reason is because they never got to keep Shabbos. How do you get to keep Shabbos? Shabbos is walking into that zone of absolute ta'anug. Kol melach asuya. All done. I'm good. I don't have to do anything. I, I'm just good in this wonderful space. Rabbi Shimon ben Yochai was known by his friends that when they, when they saw him, the Zohar says, they would call him, they had a term for him. They would say, here comes Shabbos. They called him Shabbos. Because really, what he is exhibiting is what every Jew ought to be, what every Jew actually is. What is every Jew? He is one big Shabbos. Your life is amazing. It's awesome. It's unbelievable. The situation that you're in is the best situation possible. There's only one reason why you're struggling and suffering in the situation that you're in now. And that is because you feel like you're outside the water and you feel like you're in dry land and you feel like something has to happen to come rescue you from your problems. And whatever that something is that needs to rescue you, you're right, it needs to come. Except for one thing. Instead of waiting for that something to happen, get into a Shabbos zone and start keeping Shabbos and feel that kol melach suya. all your work is done. What's your work? Whatever you want to be the work. So all humans are different. We all have something that's going to make us feel pleasure. And Shabbos is about feeling pleasure. Feeling pleasure is very nice to eat, to eat chicken soup. But there's a very limited pleasure in chicken soup. Real pleasure is a human being sitting down there beaming. If you beam the kids around you in the Shabbos table, very quickly will come back and say, oh, I'm not sure what you're doing, but I want to be like you. And I also want to keep Shabbos. And then that television screen will be like, doesn't do it for me. Because all it's doing is making me need something external to take my mind off my true issues because I'm not comfortable in myself. We live in the ocean, but Hashem made it look like dry land to give us free choice to get close to Him. And what's the ocean? A sense of pleasure. Excitement of being. It's a great space to be in. Hashem's world. So Hashem gives us this day. He gives us this time. He gives us... The Jewish people is that. Do you realize that? That the Jewish people to the world are representatives of Hashem. That's why they hate us. Because when they see a Jew, maybe the Jew doesn't see it on themselves, but the Goy sees the Jew and he sees something about that person, says God. I don't know what it is, but get rid of him. Has to show him. What you want to do is live that. Whatever that means to be a Jew, you want to live that. Rosh Hashanah is a time to crown Hashem as king. So let's understand the two modes of how you crown him as king. There's the normal mode of how you crown Hashem as king, which is by blowing shofar. And there's the Shabbos mode, which is by not blowing the shofar. Both are tremendous work. It's just a different type of work. So there's the work of blowing the shofar. What's blowing the shofar? Shofar is made out of an animal, right? Why do you take an animal? Take an animal and you go and you blow and you scream why don't you just get up and shul and go ah, and just scream there's two types two ways to dive into Hashem the normal way is by saying words 
That's what we do all year round. We daven to Hashem with words. There's a deeper way of davening, which is, we all do it sometimes, right? When things are really, really tough, what do you do? How do you daven to Hashem? You just cry. You just scream. There's no words, because it's not containable. The words don't do justice to the experience. That's Rosh Hashanah. You get up and you're just screaming your head off. But we don't scream. We take the ram's horn or the ox and we blow the horn. What's the blowing of that horn? What are we doing there? Animals have a tremendous power. Animals have a power of direction. They are intense. Right? Dogs. Dog is a man's best friend. Why? Because he doesn't talk back at you. He just walk, you walk in and he just gives you love. And humans love that. We want that sense. Animals, a lion, when he's angry, or when he needs to eat, not angry, he focuses and does whatever it takes. He doesn't think about anything else and just gets the job done. Animals have focus. Human beings, all over the place. No direction. We're like, oh, maybe that, maybe that, right? Like animals don't have phones. Because they just live, they just do their thing. Human beings all over the place, especially with a phone. We want to have the benefit, the advantage, without the deficiency of being an animal. David Amalek says, here's another Tehillim for you. I'm like an animal to you, Hashem. What does it mean an animal? Passion. Directed passion. What you're doing when you're taking the shofar is directing your passion at Hashem. You're like, Hashem, you see this animal that has absolute direction to you? I want a little bit of that. And what I'm going to do is get in shul and just go, ah, and scream. The screaming is a realization that Hashem is actually everything. And so when something comes your way and it's a difficulty, give it over to Hashem. When something's there and you need to make money and you don't have money, so what do you do? You say to Hashem, Almighty God, I don't have money, I need this money. And I'm going to talk to you, Hashem. I'm not going to worry about anything. I'm going to give it directly to you, Hashem. And so I'm going to scream from the bottom of my heart, Hashem, I'm crowning you as king. You are the source of everything that I need, direct from you. Shafer has three parts to it. There's the, uh, the blowing, and then you go, Shvarim, Trua, right? What are we doing there? It's the cry. Hashem, it's not working. You say you're in control. I'm not feeling it. It's not working. And then like your Yetzirah gets the better of you. And you're fighting. That's the inner war. That's the struggle. And then there's a key at the end. But I know you're there. Shefer is the struggle of a Jew to crown Hashem as king. Crowning Hashem as king is not theoretical. It means everything in your life comes from Hashem. Relax in Hashem's beautiful presence. But Shefer means you've got to work it. This year is a whole different type of year. This year Hashem says, Chavra, come to Shul and be mindful of the fact that you're crowning Hashem as king and don't blow a shofar. You know what that means? No wrestle. Hmm? No wrestle. I'll tell you the difference. I do a lot of fundraising, right? So there's two ways to fundraise. There's a fundraising whereby, oops, I'm stuck, I don't have any money. It is very stressful to not have money. Very, very, very stressful. So I'm like doing a budget and trying to think, oh my gosh, this year I need like $7 million. And I really need it. And I have no clue how to get even a dime. So imagine I go over to someone and I say, I need your help. But the energy is, I don't have. And I need you to help me. So I come in talk to the person and I show them I need the money please help me when the guy says okay you know what I'll give you $25,000 what 
what's the energy back going to be? Now, okay, I mean, that's really nice, but you know, I need 5 million. What's 25,000 going to do? And the guy's like, I just gave you $25,000. Like, and you can't, you're not thankful? None of this gets said. It's the underlying energy, which is, I asked you for something, and I feel like you're not appreciative of what I gave you. Let's try the other way. Let's say I walk in, and I know I need, if I need, I need $5 million. If I need $5 million, what happens? I did a Shabbos mode. All your work is done. Shafer mode means every step of the way I got to work it. Shabbos means if I need $5 million, I ask myself the question, how will you feel when you get the $5 million? That's called all your work is done. And I sit myself down every day and I go into the space for 10 minutes. Dream space. I have it. How do you feel? Relaxed is the most, the most common answer, right? I feel just relaxed, happy. Imagine Hashem tells you, I'm giving it to you. I promise you, I'm giving it to you. I need you to do one thing. I need you to go talk to 100 people. And one of them is the one. You need to talk to 100 people and ask them for this money. And one of them will give it to you. Or maybe 1,000 people, right? You go to see what's normal. And you go talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. When the guy says no, what does that mean? I wasn't asking you anyway. I don't need your money. I know that Hashem is giving it to me. Hashem said to talk to a thousand people. Because that's what's normal about making a five million dollars. So Hashem said to talk, so I'm going to talk. I don't care if you say yes or no. It makes not one inch of a difference to me. Because that's how Hashem operates. Do you ever notice how Hashem operates? Like, when you're finding a shidduch, do you ever see what happens? You do tons and tons and tons of work, and none of it ever has anything to do with the shidduch. The shidduch comes from there, and you are working over there. It always works that way. Hashem operates, it's like, I, I, I'm in control. I know what I'm doing. Relax. I'm good. But it's so hard to relax. What does Hashem want from us? He wants Shabbos zone. Shabbos zone means get into a space of everything is done. All your work is done. Most people can't do this. That's why they keep on being in a space of slavery. They just don't know how to do it. Because they keep on being in a space of I need. And so when they go out there and they ask someone for something, the energy is, I'm desperate, you can help me, that's dry land, and it doesn't work. You'll get, you won't, you'll keep on being in the negative space. And this year, Rosh Hashanah falls out on the Shabbos. What does that mean? Hashem says, it's Rosh Hashanah, you got to crown me as king. You got to realize Hashem is in control of everything, that's your work. Hashem controls everything, every little detail that happens comes from Hashem. The way to do it is by relaxing. But if you think you're going to do nothing, it's not like the first time in history when Hashem said nothing. No. Every other time you've got to do hard work. There's two types of hard work. There's hard work of every step of the way, blowing the shofar and like feeling that this is not, this is Hashem, this is good. And there's another way to do it. The marketing world realized this, you know that? You ever see like an ad? If they advertise like a, 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 a you know, a good car, big sports car. Imagine they put into a sports car a guy walking in with a beggar, walking in with ragged clothing and getting inside there and like, you know, whatever, and like a homeless guy, and then he drives off in the car. What would people think about that car? You're not buying it. What they do is they walk a guy walking in, slick, happy, right? Looks like he's got the whole world under control. His energy is one of wealth. And he walks into the car and he drives. And then everybody says, I want to be like that. It just works. When you live life and you get into that zone, it's not marketing, it's real. If you're in that zone of I have everything I need and you feel good, Shabbos mode, 
then the year becomes Shabbos mode because you made it that way. So in case you think there's no work to be done, the Torah says, the Torah says to blow Shaifa. And there's a whole question why, why the Torah says to blow. But the rabbis, they said you don't blow Shaifa and it's not just because someone may come to carry. That's the revealed reason. Inside, the reason why we blow shofar, don't blow shofar on Shabbos is because we don't need to blow shofar on Shabbos. And there's a lot to be done to get to that space. We are crowning God as King. We're making Hashem real every step of the way. We're feeling that everything that happens to us happens from Hashem. This is from Hashem. That's from Hashem. It's all from Hashem. And it's not like, okay, it's from Hashem, so I'll accept it. It's terrible. Your face needs to be beaming with absolute radiance happiness, light. And you'll be like, but I'm being messed, up, messed around. Why? Because you want it to be good, right? You want it to be good? Why do you have to wait for it to be good? Sit there, use your mind to do the optical illusion, which is real. That's the real one. And to feel that Hashem is taking care of you. Because all those times you think you're taking care of it yourself, no, you're not. He's always taking care of you. And all he wants from you is to crown him as king. Crown him as king is a personal, customized experience. It means, what does it mean that Hashem is king by you? Hashem is king by you means you got the five million dollars and that's what you need. If it means to have the Shalom Bais, then that's what you have. And you get into that space and then suddenly you start glowing. See the signs? Glowing. Glow me up. Yes, you start to glow. And you start to radiate a light of Hashem. So Rosh Hashanah that falls out on Shabbos means it's a Shabbos Dika year. It's a special year. It's a year of Hashem telling you, I'm taking care of you. Want to trust me? Or you want to keep on trying it yourself? You're not a dry land being. You're actually Al Yamim Yisada. You only live on dry land so that it could be your choice and you have free choice to do the work. But really, Hashem says, I am doing the work for you. Your job is to internalize that. That's called crowning Hashem as king. And then the year is once again our year of not blowing Shafer. And when we do it, the year that unfolds is the most incredible, unbelievable thing. Because the energy you put in is the energy you get out. So Hashem should help. We should all be inscribed for Ketiva Bechatima Tova Good, beautiful, sweet name.